So let me see. Okay. Uh, okay. Welcome. Thanks everybody for joining us today, mainly from Argentina and South America, but also from many other countries around the globe. Now, Daniel Rosato, the Argentine SPE section chairman, will have the word. Come on, Daniel, please. Okay. Uh, hi, Tom. And uh, in representation of the Argentina Petroleum Section, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation to offer this uh, lecture. It's a, a great honor to have you as our lecturer. And uh, in representation of the of this section, we want to give you with this uh, certificate of uh, recognition, which uh, is, is shown in the screen. So that's all on my on my side. Uh, uh, thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, Tom. Thank you, Daniel. OK, thanks, Daniel. Well, I am Juan Pablo Barrer, Program Chairperson of the Society of Petroleum Engineers of the Argentine section. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. It's an immense honor and pleasure to present this webinar entitled PTA, RTA, DCA Methods for the Evaluation of Well Performance in Unconventional Reservoirs, Vaca Muerta Field Examples. That has two outstanding, outstanding features. First, the immense global celebrity of our industry that generously accepted our proposal of being here today and to whom we are deeply grateful. Dr. Thomas Tom A. Blessingame. And the second feature is that besides of the luxury of having him here today, Tom Blessingham wanted to give us a treasure and generous analysis with real, current and strictly anonymized confidential data about Vaca Muerta. So we contact him with leading local specialists to whom them and to their significant Vaca Muerta company operators. And obviously, again, to Tom Blessingham, we are also very grateful in the name of the Argentine SPE section. This conference program promotes the SPE's mission to collect, disseminate, and exchange technical knowledge, as well as to provide opportunities for professionals to improve their, te te their technical skills. The SPE thanks the companies and organizations that allow their professional to serve as lecturers, in this case, Texas AM, AM University. We also thank the sponsor of this cycle conference of the Argentine section of the SPE. In the gold category to Pan American Energy, Plus Petrol and Shell. In the silver, silver category to Pampa Energia, Tech Petrol, YPF and Equinor. And in the bronze category to Halliburton and Industrias Juan F. Seco. We take this opportunity to mention the next conference of our SPE section with a virtual presence of another global celebrity, Dr. Mark Sobak, on next December 1st, with a webinar entitled Geomechanical Processes Affecting Optimization of Multi-Stage Hydraulic Fracturing. Also, with the caveat that things could change, we wanted to anticipate that Tom Blessingham could give a most desired in-person short one-day technical course on Sunday, March 19, 2023, as a prelude of the expected fourth symposium on exploration and production of unconventional resources to be held in Buenos Aires, Argentina on March 2022 of next year, 2023, at Marriott Hotel, organized jointly by the Patagonian Argentine sections of the SPE. In the coming days, you will receive an email with the link to access the video presentation of today's lecture on the website of the Argentine section of the SPE. An important notice, you can ask your questions only in the chat of this webinar. And at the end of the lecture, the moderator will post them to Tom Lessingham. To not interrupt the lecture and lessen the value of this webinar, all listeners are going to be muted. 
Right away, I leave you with Fernando Tuero, Argentine's SPE officer and leading technical executive, who will be the luxury moderator of this webinar. Please go ahead, Fernando. Thanks very much, Juan Pablo. And today I have the task of introducing Tom. So I, I if if I will read, if I read his full biography, we could be probably two or three days here sitting, trying hearing all out. So I'll give you the short one. So Thomas Blasingen, he's a professor of petroleum engineer at Texas A&M University um, in College Station, Texas. He holds a BS, an MS, and a PhD degree from Texas A&M, all in petroleum engineering. Uh, both in teaching and research activities, blasting game focus on petrophysics, reservoir engineering, diagnostics, analysis, interpretation of well performance, and conventional resources and technical mathematics. Blasting Games research effort deal with topics in applied reservoir engineering, reservoir modeling, and production engineering. He has made numerous contributions to the petroleum literature in well test analysis, analysis of production data, reservoir management, evaluation of ultra low permeability reservoirs, and general reservoir engineering. Since 1991, Mr. Blasingen has graduated 78 MS students with thesis, 37 engineers with uh, non-thesis, and 17 PhD students. He has prepared more than 190 technical articles. Tom, I don't know how you do that in a physical life because probably I did a couple and it was a lot of time. So 190 is very impressive. As well as having performed several major field studies involving geology, petrophysics, and engineering tasks. Blasingame among many memberships and acknowledgements, he was 2021 SPE president. And as a source of significant personal pride, Blasingame has also been recognized with several teaching and service awards from Texas A&M University. Lastly, he's also active in community projects such as the Y A Ariki Food Forest and his local church, St. Stephen's Anglican Church, in his adopted homeland of Onerahi. I hope you pronounced that well. New Zealand, where his wife and children permanently reside. So this is the short bio of Tom. And I'm not sure if Juan Pablo, do you do you think that should read we read the abstract of the webinar or we just go straight forward? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's okay to read the abstract. It's a short one. So okay. the, the, we, we... Just, just to put everyone on the same page, uh, this work uh, it's going to be showing multiple examples, three cases in the oil window, volatile oil, dry gas that were, was acquired from real data in operators in different parts of Vaca Muerta. These cases, of course, were anonymized by the operators and provided for this study as part of a learning exercise. So we will have a pressure transient analysis, rate transient analysis, um, and decline curve analysis. Those will be the three main topics of the, of the talk. Um, there are some characteristics of each, but I'm sure you will you will you will see it as it goes. Uh, as each of these cases are anonymous, the goal of this work is simply to perform a consistent workflow, not to draw specific or global conclusions. So this webinar should be thought of a type of demonstration workshop engagement is encouraged. And as Juan Pablo said before, we remind you that the questions can be made only in the chat of the webinar, and at the end of the lecture, myself and the moderator will pose them to Tom Blasimir. Do not interrupt the lecture and lessen the value of the webinar. All listeners are going to be muted. Uh, in the coming days, you will receive an email with a link to access to the video, as Juan Pablo said. So now I leave you with the so much expect, expected Tom blessing game. So please, Tom, go ahead. First of all, I thank you all for the invitation. Thank you all for uh, facilitating the data from the operators. And I thank all the attendees for joining us. Um, these are the kinds of things that you come away with ideas from and you say, you know what, I have a better idea than that guy, or, or maybe he got something wrong. Great. My email in, is on every slide. Uh, you can't miss it. Uh, always respond to every email. Uh, if you've got a better idea, if you've got a better interpretation, if you want to try something, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to do this. Uh, I didn't mention this in any of my uh, materials, but actually when I began my career, I did a short course in uh, Commodore Rivadavia uh, a long, long time ago, uh, back in 1990. And uh, that was where I, I fell in love with Argentina. Sorry to 
to pick one country, but uh, it was a beautiful, uh, enjoyable place. I know those of you who have lived in Comodoro can't believe someone would say that, but uh, it was an outstanding visit. So as I mentioned, I use a camera on my laptop, so I'm now going to close my laptop and I'm going to uh, take over the presentation and present from there. So with that, I'm going to turn my camera off. I'm going to close the laptop, I'm going to move it out of the way. And I am going to now begin my recording, which is a backup for um, your recording should something go wrong. And just give me one more second. OK, not, and, to, not to put any pressure to you, Tom, but we already are 100 and something people. On, on I, I saw that, you know, don't 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 make me crazy. OK, so now I'm sharing my screen and I will lose the uh, screen. So please give me a confirmation that you see it. We yep, see it. No, fine. no problem. OK, no problem. Good. OK, so I will begin my recording now and here we go. I'll move this out of the way. So hello everyone. Today is a big day. It's the 17th of November 2022. I have been invited to um, join you for a while and I do apologize in advance. I talk a lot. We have a lot of slides. Um, I will obviously uh, speak in and I only speak. Uh, was it three languages? Uh, English, bad English and profanity. So my apologies that uh, this is being done in English, but Hopefully uh, everyone would be able to follow it. And as we mentioned, we'll have a recording so you can come back to it. When I was asked to do this, my first reaction was reluctance. Um, because, you know, I have a student who one time told me, he said, you give away everything except your secrets. And I said, yes, that's true. You have to earn my secrets. So today I'll present uh, a lot of sort of backgroundish information and then I will go into the uh, the eight data cases that were submitted. These are anonymized. Um, I don't have any idea where they are or what they are. I only know uh, what you know what the uh, operator has provided. Um, the exercise was good. I think um, most operators tried to give a realistic uh, example for the submission. Uh, there were a couple of operators that that threw in a couple of toughies. Um, uh, that is a, a couple of cases that were probably designed to make me scream, uh, but they most of the cases came out pretty well. The pressure transient cases, and I'm telling you this before I show you, um, they're not bad, um, but pressure transient and unconventional is extremely um, sort of, it, it lacks um, any kind of, uh, of character because mostly what you're seeing is a fracture system and so forth. There are occasions when you'll see frack hits or other kinds of operational issues, but um, these three um, pressure transient tests are very nice. I want to thank the operators for sending those cases, uh, but they're they're exactly as I expected, and I'll, I'll go through that as well. So that was a long-winded way of starting, so let me go to the next slide. And there's just a quick review of where we came from, and then Every time I show this, people immediately, their eyes are drawn to this 1935 date, which means that it was probably worked on long before that. And, you know, the purpose of showing you this is that this is a material that really began our journey, if you want to call it that, uh, in production engineering. And this particular work was uh, about half the book was devoted to the uh, deliverability equation, which was empirical at that time. And the other half was devoted to orifice meters and things like that, which is great. And of course, it was written during the Depression, so people had time on their hands, and it was um, it was a really nice piece of work. And actually, it's located somewhere on my website as well. But the goal is just to explain that you know we had a, a, a journey getting here. And a lot of people say, well, what was the start of reservoir engineering, Tom? And the start of reservoir engineering was really decline curve analysis, which occurred about 20 years before the Johnson and Bolin paper, there are some early uh, or late um, 1900s, early 1910 to 1920 papers. Uh, but the really my my favorite is probably the Johnson and Bolin paper. They actually were almost 20 years before ARPS. They proposed these relationships of the loss ratio and the derivative of the loss ratio. And it's interesting that you know you look back and you say, well, why were they so smart? I'm not sure they were so smart. I think they just 
knew that we needed a definition and looking at the rate divided by the derivative or the derivative divided by the rate and then looking at the derivative of that made sense. The so-called D function is the um, derivative divided by the rate. Of course, you have to take the minus sign to get the positive value. And if we integrate that, we end up with the exponential decline. Uh, that is, if we assume that it's a constant. And the same thing happens with the hyperbolic relationship because that's also a differential equation and we twice integrate that and we end up with the expression for the hyperbolic. So this is just amazing stuff that, like I said, happened 1927, 1928, depending on when you're looking at the publication. Uh, but we owe them a lot. So this is, we're coming up on 100 years for this, 95, 96 years for this. And it's really amazing that, that uh, you know, it stood the test of time. So next, is some work that was uh, proposed in a paper by Jones and cited in ARPS's paper, it was 1942. The plot on the left-hand side of those uh, straight lines, this rate of decline versus years on a log-log scale uh, was really clever and it led to this equation and it led to this equation, which 68 years later, or something on the order of that, 66 years later, pardon me, um, someone stumbled onto that and that was uh, myself and a, a student. And what I was looking at was I was plotting the D function and the B function and, you know, reverse engineering what the rate would look like if that's what the uh, the D function looked like. And this is exactly what I came up with. So I thought, well, this is great. You know, I'm pretty smart, but it turns out that Jones did it 66 years earlier. Now, the real question is, why don't we use this equation more? And the answer probably is uh, that it, it doesn't give exactly precisely uh, a unique hyperbolic type behavior. It does, and it is more conservative than hyperbolic, uh, but it certainly has its applications. And historically, for me at least, uh, I've used this on dozens, if not hundreds of cases of tight gas, and those tend to work really well as well. So the next is our traditional modified hyperbolic. It, it has many fathers or many points of origin but this equation is well known as being hyperbolic at early time and then exponential at late time. And then there's a switch condition that's given by the, the point at which they become the same. I express the D of T relation because we'll use that and also give a little bit about the, the ARPS B factor being the essentially a second derivative. So the rate has a certain characteristic behavior. We fit a line through it. That line has a, a slope of a half, which actually translates into a B factor of two, uh, which is really interesting. We then move to the D of T, which is this equation, and we find that you know there's sort of a rollover feature, which we're seeing here, but not exactly. And then we see the straight line portion, again, D of T versus time on a log log plot. And we have this nice behavior. And again, its slope is one by definition for that equation. So that's a unique behavior. That's something that we can use as a diagnostic to understand this behavior. And then we have B of T versus time, which is like I mentioned, it's the, the derivative of one over T. So it's essentially a second derivative. And in this case, a real data case, it is a, a tight gas. Um, it's not a tight gas, it's a shale case. And I, I could probably tell you, it's a Haynesville case. It did have a very long period of linear flow, which is sort of to be expected in a gas case like that. So the modified hyperbolic becomes our primary mechanism for estimating forecast and, and hence reserves. And I would say our power law exponential, which is I showed here, is probably our secondary equation. Then we come along and we really need to thank Fetkovich um, once again. Uh, I know he's been gone for a while, but uh, he had so many contributions to the petroleum literature, but probably the one that stands out most in my mind is this contribution on decline type curve analysis. And, you know, I began calling it, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a splinter of rate transient analysis. Uh, that's not really what I called rate transient analysis, but um, we'll talk about that in a second. So what he did, of course, was he took the constant pressure uh, solution and he took the ARPS relation and he meticulously um, during a short course, as he told me, um, you know, overlaid one over the other until he realized that he could create this universal curve. And of course, we have to give him a lot of credit. This is the uh, very first publication uh, published case. And we all know that this is a transient portion where we can estimate permeability and skin factor. And this is the boundary dominated portion where we can estimate volume. And it looks like he has two data points that he used to estimate 
uh, permeability and skin. Of course, he had a buildup test run for every case that uh, he demonstrated in that paper. But it's just fascinating to me that he came up with something like this. And then in his very first paper, which took him seven years to publish as a as a journal article, but you know we still had the other paper for those seven years from 1973. People were using this, and you know just amazing how this changed our ability to analyze production data. So I came along a little bit later, and uh, basically in the 1980s, and then began pushing this. And the, the early 90s uh, was whenever I I reformulated Fetkovich's work into uh, any rate and any pressure history. And the the bottom line really is is that uh, the Fetkovich work very useful, very appropriate, but we needed to have something that accommodated any rate and pressure profile, and that was the message here. So, you know, you can see a, a so-called uh, well, this is actually as a shale case back in the 90s, and you know, it's a Barnett shale, but you can see the the rate performance and then the pressure performance, and then you can take these data, transform them. And we have this really nice reservoir signature. Of course, we have boundary dominated flow here and we have a fractured well signature here. And then we take that information and we plot it onto a type curve. And uh, for those of you who are wondering who wrote the first, uh, at that time I called it well performance analysis or WPA, uh, that was me. And you know I was angry that nobody else had, would write software for this. So I did it myself and you do not want to do this, but if you get mad enough, you'll do anything, and that's exactly what happened here as I wrote this uh, this software package. And of course, it looks childish by comparison to modern tools, but it was really important that somebody do this. So unfractured well case matching this data, and then fractured well case matching this data. And of course, the rest is kind of history. I generated all sorts of other models, of course, working with students to um, to capture other things that we know now as uh, that someone else relabeled this methodology as RTA. So that's just to give you a quick history lesson. OK, so the last thoughts before we go to the Bacamorta examples very quickly. Rate transient analysis, we really need to think about data considerations. And I put a couple of plots here. These are from various uh, publications. You see they calculated the bottom hole pressure, and this is where uh, in a shale gas well, or in a, um, I guess there's a little bit of oil production too. So. Um, they're they're mainly calculating bottom hole pressure based on the water column. They know the true pressure is here, and so this significantly overestimated the uh, the bottom hole pressure and or the reservoir pressure, I should say. And so there was uh, once it came online, it's probably more realistic. Uh, but even then, we don't know for sure if that's correct. And then there's a great publication that compares measured and calculated bottom hole pressures. And in this case, the measured is the solid black line. The calculated are the blue dots. They don't look that bad. I mean, frankly speaking, I've seen a lot worse in my career until you realize that the calculated buildup is way up here. So this is really far off. And this happens a lot in our calculations because of the nature of the algorithms that we're using to uh, to estimate these bottom hole pressures. Uh, probably it's overcompensating for water, but I don't know. I didn't perform this work. Um, just commenting that the cost of a bottom hole gauge, you know, in the U.S., it was probably in the thirty-five thousand dollar range, um, all in, maybe fifty thousand, depending on uh, the equipment you had to use and so forth. But realistically, you know, these are well within the noise level of cost of a completion, and you know, I was. Uh, really strongly recommending that people uh, deploy gauges. Several companies uh, have almost, uh, well, maybe not a gauge in every well, but a lot of gauges out there. And I think they've, they've more than paid for themselves. So enough of the lecture on that. Sorry for that. I just want everybody to know that measured bottom hole pressure is really critical. So ideally, we have an instantaneous flowing bottom hole pressure. That is, we get a real-time bottom hole pressure from a gauge. High resolution flow rates every five to 10 minutes is preferred every hour. We're OK. Sorry about the wrapper talk there, but I was trying to be funny. And a daily average is probably reality. Bottom hole temperature, a lot of people don't think about this, but it's really useful to correlate bottom hole temperature with bottom hole pressure for frac kits. I'm not saying that we would want to correlate rate performance with bottom hole temperature, but there's probably something we could do with that. The reality is we're, we're pretty much faced with surface pressure on hourly, perhaps higher frequencies, but probably probably we're getting some sort of daily uh, surface pressure as well. Maybe hourly, we'll see. 
daily flow rates with some speculation on the accuracy of the water rates. It's probably good enough. I'll talk a little bit about this uh, in a couple of cases that I show here. Uh, sometimes you can tell that the water is allocated or it may not be uh, measured to any high degree, which eh, in the whole scheme of things probably is OK. Completion data, we need to know the water pump, the total prop and the stage spacing, the number of stages, et cetera. And I, I want to thank the um, data contributors. They provided all of the completion and reservoir data that would be required for uh, the study. Um, I, I do appreciate that because I know it's a, a pain to sometimes go find that data. Worst case, no pressure. I've looked at thousands of cases with no pressure. That's life. Uh, daily rates, which may not accurately represent what was produced. And unfortunately, that's code for the, the data may have been allocated or it may have just been assigned a rate. Um, and then, of course, not to have the completion records, which is really frustrating because you need the completion records to orient yourself. So picking up the pace a little bit, one of the things that's happened is there's a, a, a movement out there to look at linear flow plots, which is generally speaking the reciprocal productivity index or the delta P over Q versus a square root of time plot. And I want to tell you guys, I, you know, I'm not a real big fan of this, but if you're going to do this, let's use the log log diagnostic plot so that we can see this behavior. And what we're really looking for is this slope. So you're really looking for the logarithm of delta P over Q versus log T and minus five for me, because this is not a minus, it is a plus sign on this particular orientation, but it doesn't matter. You're, what you're looking for is this slope of two uh, run over one rise. And you can see that these data, which are taken from an actual set of well data, I've anonymized them as best I can. I've shown this dozens of times. It is a reciprocal productivity index. It is the material balance time. And you can see um, you know, just a number of wells with a what appears to be a very strong linear flow signature. Uh, this is not pseudo steady state to the best of my um, belief it is probably liquid loading. We can talk about that later on. So all we do now is we transform the axes. No longer is this logarithmic and no longer is this logarithmic. Now it's Cartesian. So we're looking at the reciprocal um, productivity index versus the square root of material balance time. So this line on this plot becomes this line on this plot. And you can see much more data noise. Primarily, that's because of the nature of the uh, logarithm that we were looking at here. And you can see more clustering. And all of these uh, sort of spikes or strings that you see, that suggests to me that this is some sort of a, a liquid loading problem. And we can talk about that more later on if someone wants to. It's a traditional plot, like I mentioned, the delta P over Q versus square root of time. And people are generally looking for the end of linear flow as though it has some metaphysical meaning. Uh, and whenever I say that this is not RTA, because to me, RTA is matching the entire data set with a reservoir model. This is simply an analysis plot. And I will absolutely state that I've done this in the past. I've written about this. I've worked on this. But ultimately, this takes us back into the 1960s with the Milheim and Zenkiewicz approach of looking at fractured well performance. I just I, I repeatedly am giving you warnings to be careful with this. Have I used this for certain things? Yes. Have I used this and looking at the slope and intercept? Well, obviously the slope is fixed here. Have I used this correlating this uh, this slope with uh, the calculated EUR or the estimated EUR from the production profile? Yes, I've done that. I've, I've also correlated with initial rate. I've correlated with other things as well. And would encourage you to do so as well. But these are not RTA type calculations. These are more of a correlation. Okay. Sorry, I think I skipped two slides. Nope. We'll just go with this. This is only to show you that you can generate a horizontal multi fractured well and then start putting in a, um, a horizontal fracture at various points. And it will give you very significantly different uh, behavior than what you might have expected. And this is not designed to say that the horizontal multi-fractured wells have uh, horizontal fractures in addition. What it's trying to say is there are complex fracture networks. Uh, in some plays, there may actually be a horizontal fracturing component. Um, I, I won't speculate now, but I could I could tell you there's one in North Louisiana that probably has some elements of a horizontal fracturing uh, nature. But you know, so when you see non um, expected trends in your rate performance, 
you need to be thinking, are these complex fractures? Maybe, maybe not. Last word on that is I had a student run a, a series of uh, simulations. Uh, first, the simulation was to generate a fracture network using a random walk system. Um, very bright, very uh, creative young man, um, and he generated uh, literally dozens of these cases. We then simulated them, and unfortunately, because of the nature of the simulation, the grid blocks need to be one centimeter, and that makes for a very um, high conductivity fracture. Uh, so these are essentially unloading initially, and that's what this gigantic signature is and all these plots. What you're really looking for is this behavior, which is the behavior that is feeding the fracture system uh, after the fractures deplete uh, with that initial surge. So it almost looks like a dual proxy system, but this is totally a simulation artifact. So what we're doing is, is then taking the derivative of this and looking at its nature, and you can see there's variations in that. And then depending on how many branches you have, we were able to correlate that derivative, this, this beta derivative, which shows you that as you have more branches, you actually become more homogeneous if you want to think about it in that sort of way. And of course, we did not allow these fractures to touch each other, and we did not allow, uh, this is only the, the simple open fracture case. They're not uh, touching other fractures that might be from other wells as well. And I'll also talk about that uh, later on. We need to recognize that there are a lot of short circuits in the geology and in the fracturing, you may have a fault, you may have a fracture that, that communicates directly. These are facts of life. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is the more complex the fracture system is, the more, um, the easier it is for the well to produce, obviously, but also the, it could conceivably, if we could uh, generate a, a completely random fracture field, it could uh, significantly enhance the ability of the formation of flow. This is not part of this lecture, it's just a comment. So, And then last but not least, we'll cover a couple of things on PTA. This is a, a paper from 2012, so it's a little bit uh, dated, but absolutely relevant to our discussion. I just wanted to point out that uh, these are from the Bakken Shale. This one third slope, which I, they've, uh, uh, they've highlighted a half slope here, but I've had highlighted a one, or sorry, they've highlighted a one quarter slope. I've highlighted a, one third slope. And this one third slope could be a variety of things. It could be a multi phase flow effect. It could be a fracture geometry effect. It could be a combination of the two. There's a community that also believes there's something called anomalous diffusion. And I don't want to disagree with them, but um, that that is also a possibility. Anomalous diffusion is something that generates a signature that is essentially power law in nature. So this could be part of that. The second case um, is also a uh, 2.5 or 2 to 5 slope or a 0 0.4 uh, slope and it occurs in both the pressure and the derivative. Again, just pointing out that someone has published on this. They have seen these anomalous slopes and you know this is entirely a possibility that uh, that it, we could see this as well. So that was my message. Next is a series of plots from a student of mine that uh, had some field data. This was published last year and you know these are uh, short term ish, uh, they're, so they're, they're all opportunity type buildups, the same as we'll probably always see. And, you know, that is that it's not a designed uh, test. It's just something that came up and you can see that that they all look similar. And then uh, these are each uh, a, an in individual well. So there are three um, buildups during this case. There's two buildups during this case. There's three buildups during this case, two here, two here and then three here. And what I'm saying is, OK, you can see that the linear flow behavior comes from the model. You can't see it because I put the line on top of it, but you can see that the data suggests there's no linear flow. There is a little bit of linear flow here as it, it comes out, and these are very short time. This is uh, one hour. And then we can also see that there's a signature here that looks like there's both uh, linear flow from the model and possibly from the data, although some of these don't agree. Again, linear flow from the model and from the data no linear flow period, not even the model could uh, could give us that. And then this one, there is linear flow, uh, but the curves as from the data, the curves don't really, um, sorry, the, the data doesn't really indicate that the model does. And this could be some sort of a producing time effect. You know, these are all really short tests. So it could be something of that nature. I show you this because I guarantee you 
is going to look very familiar in just a couple of minutes. OK, so the next slide. Is there's more this would, as someone mentioned earlier, it would take a lot longer to explain this, but I'm going to just try to give it my best shot. So what they do is they open a well and they watch for the response of that well that they put on production. They pop the well and they watch for the response of the wells around it. And so this is a great idea, you know, to uh, kind of a, an interference test, if you want to think about it that way. And this is looking into the reservoir. It's the usual wine rack or, as we say, shotgun um, type pattern. And so you're seeing that they're putting this well on production and it has an effect on this well. And then they they put another well on production and it has effect on this well and that well. There's not a lot of effect on this one, but what they do is then they take the response because they have a gauge at each well and they take that response at the 4H, they take the response at the 6H and they take the response at the 5H and they create a short term event type plot out of it, both the pressure drop and the derivative. And then they plot what's called the Chow derivative group, which is essentially the same as what we've been using, which is called the beta derivative, except that they uh, chose to formulate it as uh, the pressure drop divided by two. Uh, divided by the derivative, and we just defined it as the pressure drop derivative divided by the pressure drop, but that's neither here nor there. They plotted that on this plot, and they're trying to show that the the more, the higher this value is, the more connected it is. And there's actually kind of a mental precedent for this, if you want to think about it that way. So the more connected you might see these fractures, or the more uh, branches of those fractures, then possibly the more connected this might be. There are presently a lot of people trying to study this with simulator. Um, I hope this works. Um, it is not designed to give you formation properties. It is designed to give you an estimate of how connected or interconnected these wells are. So now, before we start with the Bacamorta examples, and yes, I realize we're well into this discussion. A few personal comments. I was asked to perform this work as part of this we webinar. I do not know the submitters nor the specific case. This is a blind test. I cannot share the data. It belongs to the operators who submitted it. I did not put the results on the slide. It's about process, not results. Um, and the reason is that a lot of simple things may make a lot of difference. So maybe and I'm not saying they did, but maybe they gave me the wrong porosity, which is unlikely and that's not going to have much effect. But maybe they gave me the wrong formation th thickness, which again, probably isn't true. But, you know, there could be something that they gave me that isn't representative. And I did have to make a judgment call because each of them gave me a description of the completion. So I had to make an estimate as to how many hydraulic fractures are probably contributing to any given case. And lastly, sort of a testament, I didn't consult on any with anyone on this and it's all my own work. So, you know, as this recording is being made and as this presentation is going to be available to you, you'll have to make your own decisions. I'm happy to talk about other cases, you know, details. If you want me to look at something with you or, or work with you on something, that's absolutely fine. I'm not volunteering, but I'm just saying I cannot share these data. So there, there was no uh, my agreement with them was I would do this work and their agreement with me was that they would facilitate the, you know, the submission of these data. And, you know, we came up with a protocol not to uh, the share the details. And I agree to that. The operators agree to that. Everybody's happy. I will comment that uh, Juan Pablo, I owe you a big favor because you managed to um, to help me push whenever, um, you know, we needed to get these data out. And uh, I won't mention any companies by name, but I just again thank all the companies that that donated. And I know there's a couple that want to donate, and maybe we'll do another case like that some other time. General comments: Several of these cases were severely affected by operations. You know this. I'm sure you know this much better than I do. Uh, I'm just mentioning this because I want everybody to realize I can't interpret around an operational feature. I can't calculate around an operational feature. No one can, you know, and if you think you can, you're 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 in you're then uh, analyzing and interpreting an artifact, which is not going to end well. Operations affected cases are very difficult for the DCA. So I had this grand vision of this beautiful DCA, um, you know, which you've seen in some of my publications that didn't happen here. These these cases are 
um, are, are their operations cases. They they would need a lot of uh, massaging of the data. Um, so, you know, you're going to get a zero order DCA. It's going to be a presentation of the data and the uh, the fit with the modified hyperbolic and the parallel exponential. OK, you've heard enough. Now let's get on the roller coaster. Well, number one is an oil well. Well, number one has a, uh, a significant history and you can see that oil is a dominant phase. There was a higher frequency of data taken early on for about the first, uh, looks like eight or nine months. And then it went to a less frequent, but no problem. That looks pretty good. Gas rate looks pretty good. Um, the water rate is okay. There's a little bit of um, jumble in it, but that, that's okay. And, and I actually you see the jumble in all the data functions. Pressure profile looks really good, um, much better than than average, if you want me to say it that way. Then there was a shut in and the well was brought back online and there was some jumble in the rate data, water rate data, which recovered tremendously. The oil rate data uh, came back up, which this probably was a frac hit. Um, nobody told me, but it was, yeah, I mean, OK, it's a frac hit. Um, and you can see that the water and gas or sorry, the uh, the oil and gas came back up. Oil came back right on its trend, which is truly amazing. Gas never really came back up and water is uh, much higher. The interesting thing is what happened to the pressure. Now, these pressures are obviously incorrect. And uh, so the other thing is, is it, well, I say they're incorrect, but they just don't seem uh, correct in any way, shape or form. You have the pressure appearing to correspond with these water rates, but I'm not sure. And maybe the, the data became better later on. So as you can expect, I'm not going to be able to match everything. So just bear with me. So the very first attempt was to simply match the uh, production history before the uh, shut in and subsequent, I, like I said, I think as a frac hit, and then to match the pressures. And you know, you're gonna do a lot of things in your career, but this is pretty good data. I, I mean, there, there definitely is a frequency, uh, a rate frequency issue. Um, pressure frequency is probably as well. I probably should have taken these little points out, but uh, the history match is, is just excellent. The signature on the diagnostic plots, pressure function or uh, productivity index, a reciprocal productivity index function and derivative of that. Both of these look really good. Uh, the so-called blasting gain plot, which is the productivity index, and then it's um, integral and it's integral derivative. They look pretty good as well. This is probably a wellbore storage effect. It's happening at a, a relatively small time, but it also could be just this. Um, looks like there was a lot of uh, issues, so they brought the well online, then had to take it offline or had to take it way down, and then brought it back on, and there's a lot of fluctuations in the behavior. So, you know, I had to make a decision about where to start, so I started where it began declining. And then just the so-called Fetkovich plot, which is the uh, rate and cumulative projection for this. So what about the decline curve analysis? Well, you can tell by inspection that this is more or less going to be an exponential. You know, you may say, well, OK, it's flatter here, but no, it actually kind of comes back on trend. So it's not a surprise that the uh, oil rate is matched by essentially, um, you know, I, I let it stay hyperbolic um, and, you know, there's not as much of an exponential push on here. And then this is the, uh, the parallel exponential, which unfortunately does not have sort of a flattish behavior. You have to tolerate a little bit of an angle here. And then it comes through and it matches extremely well as well. And it has a parameter that you can turn uh, like a knob to make it more exponential. Um, so essentially this behavior is exponential ish and it was really difficult to match the cumulative production because of this early flow back. And again, if we reinitiated the analysis here, we'd have a much nicer um, decline curve analysis, but that really wasn't the purpose of the discussion. It was simply to show the, um, the oil rate data and then the cumulative oil and try to match it with um, a, a, an appropriate decline curve model. So the next slide is a gas well. And in this case, we're going to go to the gas one. So it also has a very strong near exponential behavior in the gas rate. There's no oil here uh, the, or none was reported. You can see quite a bit of oscillation. OK, so this was flow back. You start to see oscillations in the uh, water rate. You see a jump here where there's a, a clear change in pressure. Uh, 
ironically, you don't see a lot of a change in, in rate for that, but um, that may or may not be um, necessarily important. Uh, you know, so let's see what the RTA looks like. So the RTA simply matching, um, putting it into the software package and, you know, working the magic. Here's the so-called log log plot, so-called blasting game plot. You can see the, the functions look good. The matches are excellent. Again, the Fetkovich plot is just a rate versus a uh, rate and cumulative versus time plot, sort of a summary plot. Match on the cumulative historical data is excellent. A little bit off here, but that's probably okay because we lost the rate match here as well. Could be the pressures aren't quite right, not sure, but the rate and pressure match throughout here uh, up until about this point, which I'm not really sure what happened here. Uh, they're just almost perfect. So, you know, I, I shouldn't say perfect. I should just say, given the quality of the data and the operational activities, uh, this is a very good case. Very good case. Next is the decline curve analysis. And as I mentioned, all you had to do is sort of visualize a straight line through the data. And again, I know you're thinking, well, it looks like it's flatter here. I know, but we have to kind of do trendology and trendology tells me that's basically an exponential. So to make a long story short, gas rate data, parallel exponential and modified hyperbolic essentially tuned to near exponential conditions. Uh, again, we don't match the uh, cumulative production because of the increasing rate data uh, here. So we didn't capture that, but not not bad. This is probably one of the better cases of where we were able to map at least the later time data with the decline curve function for cumulative production. Next is a Vacamorta oil well. Um, you're gonna, there's another uh, four of these before we get back to a gas well. Just glancing at it, this also looks exponential-ish. It's probably not completely exponential, but exponential-ish. Data frequency is a bit less on this case. Um, all the functions look good. They look representative. There is a little bit of bouncing around um, in the data. You can see um, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, I, I, there's, I want to say there's not a lot of data, but uh, there's plenty of data to do the analysis, but you can see that the gas rate kind of went up and then it fell and the water rate reflected that. Oil rate didn't really change much. Well, let's just see what the RTA has to say. So um, what I did here is I just best fitted the, all the data and remarkably this didn't do bad. This um, it's a little bit hard to capture in the diagnostics when you're not looking at a declining function uh, because the pressure and rates are not completely aligned. That can happen, but generally speaking, the diagnostics here look pretty good. The data that is, and the history match, of course, is great. Same with the so-called blasting game plots. The, the diagnostics look pretty good. Maybe the derivative function is not so hot, but it, it's okay. And then just to go on ahead and history match it, you know, with with these matches, looks really well. The the cumulative is excellent, and the pressure is excellent. So actually, really good case from that standpoint and then decided to only um sorry that was the next case i and then it, it okay no it was this one i apologize um i i only analyzed the declining data you can see the history match is better the the match of the cumin is excellent the match of the pressure is excellent but what's much much better is the diagnostic plot so you can see much clearer uh, diagnostic data behavior much clearer diagnostic data behavior and the model matches are excellent throughout there. So now we'll go to the DCA. And as I mentioned, um, I didn't impose it, you know, because there is a little bit of variation. It's it's more hyperbolic ish on the oil rate. And you can see that it's matched by this uh, a bit higher hyperbolic. And then the power law exponential comes in. It does match all the data, but of course it has a, a lower extrapolation tendency. Um, it, it could be manipulated, but, you know, just following the nature of the the equation is going to be lower than the modified hyperbolic. So I think this is a, a not a bad case, um, all things considered. You know, the, the rate data is matched reasonably well, and the uh, the RTA is just excellent. So now another Bacamorta oil case. And this one, of course, is our first case with a really big buildup in it. This buildup is almost 200 days. Uh, the oil rate looks pretty good. It looks great after the buildup. Gas rate looks pretty good. Gas rate looks pretty good after the buildup. Water rate, this is what I was talking about before. This is uh, allocated or not. Um, there's no decimal point here. You know, this is 10, so this is 
19, this is 26 or maybe 31. So there's not a lot of resolution in these water rate data. Something very strange happens here. They drop the pressure and that should have caused the rates to go up, but in fact, they went down. And this is um, a little bit concerning. I mean, obviously there's an operational issue with the well. I don't know for sure whether this, uh, you know, it looks like the water is becoming unstable. Maybe that was what was causing this problem. I don't know. Um, there was a long-term shut-in. The water, if you were making a, you know, sort of armchair extrapolation, it does stay on trend. Gas rate uh, is actually better than trend, and the oil rate is better than trend. So this is going to be a little bit difficult to try to, you know, figure out how to match uh, this part of the data and then to extrapolate it over to here, but we'll do our best. And of course, in this case, we do have a nice pressure buildup to analyze as well. So the very first thing I did was to go on ahead and just match this portion of the data so I can get a feel for what this looks like. It is highly affected by what appears to be a skin effect. And, you know, there is, I did have to do, use a little trick here to capture this behavior, but, you know, don't twist my arm. I, I just, it just was a little trick to try to capture that. Uh, the blasting game lot plot looks pretty good and the Fetkovich plot looks pretty good. But again, it's only this minor snip in here, about 400, um, 50, 500 days uh, worth of data. And then comes the big shut in. Now, looking at this, you know, what do we do? Can we simply extrapolate this and see what happens? And that's exactly what I did. I just took that relationship and extrapolated it across. And I did try um, a lot more than I'm letting on to match this by uh, playing with parameters and playing with, um, with, with things that I could play with. I'll just say it that way. It wasn't having it, and this is pretty normal that after a major shut in that we do see some sort of characteristic uh, change in the uh, the well performance. Um, the well performance is much more stable. Uh, now it's stopped declining. Um, you know, maybe there's some aspect of that. Now we've considered all the data in the uh, the diagnostic plots. They they do show the superposition effects due to the the shut-in but the trends are still pretty good they're they're reasonable to interpret and the model matches are are good as would be expected we're a little bit low on this part of the uh, data but the rest of it matches pretty well so let's look at that pressure transient test and the first thing you're thinking is you know what this looks really good it does um but I was not able to capture this little bit here at the end. And even though this is a really long pressure transient test, it does suggest that, you know, there may be something that I just can't do. And in full disclosure, I did use a, a very low or finite conductivity fracture model to capture this. And I thought it would also capture that. And after a lot of time spent trying to improve that, um, this is really the best I could do. So in the whole scheme of things, you know, I think it looks pretty good, but someone I'm sure is thinking, well, I can do better and, you know, I can force this down. Not sure about that because this, again, is a finite conductivity model, which uh, this actually has a lower slope than that. So it would take some doing to achieve that. Uh, the overall history match pretty good prior to shut in, during shut in, good. And then we overshoot it during the um, the extrapolation, which again is kind of expected there. I didn't mention this, but every time we go to this software, uh, we're not using oil rate here. We're using a total rate, which includes uh, gas and water converted on a molar basis to a total rate. So it could be that that we're not going to match this. Um, so there's the the guidance that I would give you is that, you know, this looks like a great PTA match, um, but you know you have to keep it in context and again i showed you those earlier pta matches from the midland basin which are all kind of characteristic of this as well so we'll we'll expect more of this next is the history match uh, or the sorry the decline curve analysis match of the um the performance and again we're not going to match this probably um, because you know it's, it's it's artificial it's it's happening from here and you can see that we we were unable to match that but ironically, we are able to match this. So using a hyperbolic or modified hyperbolic, um, we are able to match this whole sequence. This is a terminal exponential. So this actually didn't have, and I only put it on here for visualization. This actually is just hyperbolic. So this is a pretty good uh, match of a hyperbolic 
curve with this particular data set. I went on ahead and, and used the opportunity with the parallel exponential to make it more conservative. I, I pushed it not through this part of the data, but through this and then through this part and let it decline. So, you know, I think both of these are realistic and both of these curves, if we were to have taken them and projected them onto here, would have matched essentially the entire sequence of data minus this, of course, and minus that. So just something to keep in mind. Again, this is really sort of a rudimentary decline curve analysis with these models. Uh, no data cleanup, just sort of a, a what can you tell me about this? Okay. Next is another oil case with another buildup. Thank you very much. Um, the first thing that sticks out is this looks right, and then this is not. And the first thing you're thinking is, okay, they just didn't report this correctly. Um, no, I went back and I checked the uh, tubing pressures as well, and they also showed this characteristic behavior. So I think they were probably isolated from uh, the system um, in a way that it wasn't getting the uh, the correct pressure, or maybe I don't, you know, I don't want to speculate that there was a a leak at the gauge or something like that. And these are all surface pressures, of course, or they would have been calculated from surface pressures, I'm sure. Uh, so we have the first shut in, which is a real no no reservoir engineering value. We can't use it for anything. And then we bring the well back on production and things don't look so good. You know, it, it recovered oil rate, but then it immediately dropped. It recovered gas rate, but then it immediately dropped. Water rate is lower than expected, but it's really unstable. So then they shut the well again for a couple hundred days. And what comes back is pretty amazing. The oil rate's much better. The gas rate's much better, and the water rate just sort of seems to have tailed off completely. So maybe there could be an argument that in that case, the um, you know the shut-in actually isolated the water. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just kind of speculating out loud. So don't judge me too harshly. Okay. So what we're going to do again is we're going to use the very first event, since theoretically it would be the cleanest, and it has very short diagnostic properties it's the first 50 days but it looks pretty good it's all transient of course and then we look at the blast game plot and it's pretty good as well we didn't capture on derivative but that's not really a surprise and then the Fetkovich plot is just really a history match of the rate and cumulative with the model so what do we do now well now we open this up and we expand it across all of this data so let's see what that looks like and it's not bad you know it it doesn't match the buildups obviously but um, the production history behavior is not that bad. The, the pressures and the rates correlate uh, here and here, and then they even correlate over here, which is, is kind of amazing. So this may be an anomaly in that the, um, the buildup did not harm the system. It actually helped the system. I'm not suggesting we do buildups for helping the system, but it is, uh, it is strange that it did work out that way. Um, there could also be other factors I don't know. There could be installation of offshore, uh, artificial lift. There could have been a well clean out. There could have been all sorts of other things. I just don't know what happened here. I'm only reporting what the reservoir engineering side sees. Okay. And so we look at the diagnostic plots, even though they're, you know, this section of data, this section of data, and this section of data are included, and it's kind of wonky here. It looks really good from a standpoint of a um, sort of a signature. Same thing with the so-called blasting game plot. It also has a really good signature here as well as here and even sort of right here as well. So let's take a look, see what the buildup looks like. And again, this was another buildup, which really, um, if it didn't take years off my life and it looked, at least it took hours. Um, but I want to be honest, uh, I was really pleased with the fact that I could match this buildup using the uniform flux solution, not the finite connectivity solution. So uh, we're actually doing better than expected here. And you could argue, OK, well, maybe if you'd used, um, you know, something that could have pushed this up a little bit. Recall the other one um, was a little bit different than that. Uh, but, you know, arguably I I'm OK with this. I think this is a pretty good match. Uh, there could be a producing time effect from having a relatively short production period here. Uh, I don't think that's the case, but but this could be uh, an anomaly of that. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying it it, it could be an effect. But as you can see, really strong uh, history match. Can't really argue with it. You know, I probably should have made the points bigger on all these so you couldn't see the difference. But I do want to be honest and straightforward that, you know, I'm not sure that we could have done much better than this, but possibly. 
And again, the, um, the so-called semi-log plot, it's reasonably good. What's really amazing is the history match. It doesn't look good to you, but it looks really good to me here, 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 and even here. I know it doesn't match here, but we knew there was an anomaly with the data as well. So let's take a look at the DCA. We know we're not going to match. We might match this and we might match this, but we probably shouldn't try too hard to match this. And I'll go on ahead and tell you a little surprise. That's where that is. And of course, that didn't work out very well. So we forced uh, an analysis here and it kind of skips over and comes over to here just like the other one. And yeah, um, it did recover quite well, um, but it's still, you know, it's not exponential, but it's a low hyperbolic type extrapolation. And both the power law exponential and the modified hyperbolic indicate it's not exponential, but it's not, you know, it's not hyperbolic. So uh, it's not strong hyperbolic. Sorry about that. So just wanted to point out again, a very uh, complicated case like this, still got a reasonable match of DCA for that case. Okay, now we're coming back into um, another um, Bacamorta well. It, it's also oil. Uh, this is a beautiful data trend. Um, you know, you can see where they're bringing the well on production slowly. Uh, they're, you know, they did have uh, the choke management in this portion. And of course, that complementary effects here. Unfortunately, this is going to be difficult to match both in terms of rates and pressures. Uh, you can see the pressure profile is pretty good through here, but I uh, just want to warn everybody that the DCA will be affected by this. And then we come out, data looks great, looks great, looks great. Something's going on here. It's obviously operational. It's probably uh, that the well is no longer able to lift itself. Uh, as effectively. I don't know that for sure. There's not a lot of character in the pressure, but we can see that the, the gas and water rates are dropping rapidly and the oil is following. And then something occurred here. They all came back up, but they're probably all going to go back on to a declining trend. So very quickly looking at the RTA and as expected, um, you know, coming from the declining side, I did try to capture this, but it was very difficult coming from the declining side. Magnificent match. There's a glitch here. Um, it has to do with this, probably this pressure data point there. So my apologies. I should have taken that out. Cumulative production match is excellent. Pressure match, excellent. Diagnostics, excellent. Blasting game diagnostics, excellent. Petkovich diagnostics, excellent. So, you know, there's no real surprise in this case. This is a beautiful data set. It's, it's essentially a textbook perfect data set. A little bit of an issue again with early time performance. Ignore that. A little bit of an issue with late time performance. And again, that's probably operational. So let's see what happens. So now we come to the uh, DCA match and we are matching the oil rate. Uh, and again, if you ignore the, uh, the early part, which is the choke management part, you got a very strong signature very, very strong signature, almost uh, two orders of magnitude, well, order of magnitude and a half, so a log cycle and a half of really nice data. We have a great match with the modified hyperbolic. Again, I added the terminal decline part here, otherwise it'd just sort of be a straight line. And then we also have the power law exponential, which comes through all of the data as well, but it has a more conservative extrapolation. So, you know, you want to give a, a data case five stars. This is probably as good as it's going to get. Um, again, um, we could reinitialize, analyze from this point, and it would it would probably you know be spot on the entire curve. Um, of course, we we'd have to factor that into whether or not that's really what we want to do. But of course, I've done that a thousand times as well, and I'm sure many of you have as well. But just simply plotting this on, taking its um, its match, really really good case. So now coming to our next case, which is another gas well. And in this case, we again have a large scale pressure buildup. Now the other pressure buildups were for oil wells. This one's for a gas well. The first thing I want you to notice is that there is an approximate exponential or straight line behavior here. Uh, you also see this characteristic behavior in the water and the gas rates. Not sure what that means. Long term shut in, very long term shut in and then bring the well back online. It is sputtering a little bit with water. It comes back, but it never comes back even close. So we're looking at approximately 40, 45 barrels of water a day 
compared to well over 100 barrels of water a day before the shut-in. The really amazing thing is that the gas rate responds and is uh, much better um, in some regards than what we would have expected because we would expect it to be way down here. They could argue that you could just take it and move it over here, but that wouldn't really be fair. Um, but it could be looked at that way. So I just want to warn everybody to expect uh, sort of an exponential ish, excuse me, um, response in particular on the DCA for the gas rate. So the very first thing we do is what I've done all along is to match this part of the data. And I just went on ahead and extrapolated. it. I think in the back of my mind, I knew that I was not going to capture the post buildup behavior uh, based on you know, all the other things I'd been working on. I did quasi match the features, but not particularly well. Uh, didn't match this either, but really the, the rate profile match, not, not too, too bad uh, with the exception of this. And then extrapolating it, you know, I apologize. It's, it's a bit of a disappointment. We did catch the later portion of the flow rate data, but there's no way we'd come back up and, and catch this in terms of the cumulative production. So we did lose something here. Um, you know, there's probably um, kind of an awkward moment because I, I don't like to speculate, but this water went somewhere. It had well over a year to go somewhere. Um, you know, you were producing 150 barrels of water a day. Now you're at 40. Um, I think I think this is an effect on the system that fundamentally changed the model due to the buildup. Um, you know, looking at simply this portion, you know, we have reasonably good features here, not great, pretty good features here. And then, you know, of course, you're dominated by those uh, those changes. So really the question is, what does the pressure buildup look like? And, you know, I want to say this looks phenomenally good. I'm not really sure what this is. I think this may be an artifact of the model. Um, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, there could be um, an issue with the model itself. There could be an issue with uh, producing time effect or something like that. I, I don't know. This looks OK. I'm just not sure what this is. But the rest of it is, is essentially perfect. So this is an excellent match. Um, and again, just want to comment You know that we did also match the pressure profile reasonably well, match the buildup very, very well. And again, we're using the total rate here, which is comprised of the water combined with the gas at a molar, you know, with a molar or a mass uh, basis. So coming back to the decline curve analysis, sort of what I told you uh, before we came in is that you pretty much expect an exponential performance here. And there's really no way we're going to match this. You know, there's just it's it's not going to happen because of the nature of this behavior. And again, the model fund, the reservoir model fundamentally changed. And somewhere in here, I actually mentioned that. So, you know, I, I'm not sh exactly sure what happened with the buildup. It did shut off the the water, but and it did increase the gas. But I'm not I, I can tell you the mismatch between the reservoir model uh, here and here. It just speaks that something changed. So we're not sure what that is as well. Last case, and want to thank the operator for throwing me a curveball. Uh, they probably thought that this one was not analyzable. Uh, we have a nice oscillating uh, oil rate with a lot of uh, variation or, or sort of noise or erratic behavior. Gas rates reasonably well behaved, follows oil rate very, very well. Water rate, similarly, there's a big jump up here that kind of came out of nowhere. Then there's it comes back sort of on this oscillating trend another jump or two, and then another trend. The pressure data, if you're following my mouse, looks pretty good. It goes up and then it comes back down. And I know most of you are thinking, there's no way you're going to be able to analyze this. Eh, maybe, maybe not. There's also sort of an exponential projection here, but let's wait and see. Maybe that projection looks more like this. Let's just wait and see what happens. OK, so the very first thing I can tell you, dead drop, put all the data into I captured it where it first began to decline, put it all into the software, uh, into the interpretation. Really good uh, reciprocal productivity index analyses, pretty good blasting game analyses, I, actually probably better than this one, uh, just by the, you know, sometimes it works out that way. For those of you who are aware, this is reciprocal productivity index and this is productivity index. They shouldn't really vary that much, 
Um, when I first began doing this work, I actually focused on this plot, and then I had a nasty phone call from Petrovich that said I had to include, uh, you know, decline functions have to go down, so I just made them both for the rest of my career. And of course, we carry along a, a match of the rate and cumulative production as well. So either one of these is really the same thing, but looking at them both kind of makes a, it gives you more confidence that this is a pretty good match. And you'll notice matching the rates, matching the pressures, and matching the cumulative production. This is not an accident. You know, this model really does pick up all of these features. So this is a good sign. So next, as I mentioned, I've sort of fo forced an exponential here just to kind of get a feel for what's going on. And then there's this recovery feature. And exactly what you'd expect when you plot the data, you get just a big mess and you sort of get this exponential, which is here. And then you get this recovery feature, which is here. And this is not something that DCA is de designed for. We'll talk about this in a minute, but this is not something that DCA, as we know it, is designed for. So we'll need to think about what could we do to improve DCA when we know we have a significantly changing bottom hole pressure, a significantly uh, different conditions, if you want to think about it that way. So now a few questions. Have we hit a wall with PTA, RTA, DCA, and unconventional reservoirs? And some of you know this. In fact, one of you on this call is on the committee, but we have an annual uh, advanced technology workshop. It's been in Galveston the last few years, and it's been virtual once. And in this workshop, we have operators present cases. We have service companies present cases. We have uh, academics present discussions and so on. Uh, we need more uh, operators presenting in this, but the discussions are good. And, you know, we always talk about, okay, we know we have rates, we know we have pressures. Will temperature help? And are there other variables that'll help? Will distributed uh, temperature and pressure sensing help? It could. Diagnostics, you know, I keep having to remind people it's just rate and pressure data. You may be asking too much of it. And what we've tried so far and what we is, is me and the ant that's in my pocket, We've tried integration, we tried first derivatives, second derivatives, Laplace transforms, splines, averaging, outlier rejection, uh, regularization, et cetera. And then I said, what's next? Do we go back to um, sort of some sort of basics like looking at graphical plots or do we go to some sort of data proxy? Um, this has been done before as well where we approximate uh, the data function by some sort of a uh, uh, contrived uh, behavior. Uh, wavelets are pretty good for this as well. Uh, I remember when uh, an operator, or not an operator, sorry, a service vendor created a software with wavelets. I was a little concerned that it was uh, not representing the data, but I have to admit I've, I've kind of come full circle that I think there are things we could use as data proxies and wavelets may be one of them. In terms of data analytics, we need exhaustive data sets and not just selected data sets. Sometimes we see selected data sets and things look pretty good. It's kind of like using a neural network on a training set and then applying it across. All of a sudden you see, hey, it worked great on a selected set, but not so well on an exhausted set. But these are all things that are going to happen. Uh, you have the data and it's going to be relatively convenient to apply this. But I think you have to apply it in the context that this is an add-on. It's, it's something that you're doing to improve your interpretation, improve your understanding of what you know and don't know. Uh, let me throw some things at the wall and see if they stick. Decline curve analysis, it's more ARPS than science. Yes, I trademarked that phrase. No, I'm joking, but I did make it up. Um, B of T models, this is where you start with a, an assumed behavior of B of T. Uh, there are a few, or I should say many, uh, some of which I've developed. D of T models, there are a lot of those um, out there. There's statistical models where people took an equation from a statistics text, um, you know, maybe the logistical growth model or the Weeble model. Um, you know, there's some other sort of non-standard models. The Duong model might be one uh, that's, it, I think he believes it's a semi-analytical method because of the root behavior of the cumulative production and the rate versus time. So that's the material balance time versus time type behavior. Uh, that has to meet a certain criteria. There are hybrid models out there. Again, I've created some of those myself where you take a, uh, a known model like for a, a gas well that you can derive and then you couple it with a hyperbolic or you couple it with an exponential or you do something else with it. Semi-analytical models, there are at least two or three that I can think of off the top of my head, which are approximate solutions to a fractured well case. 
uh, generally those have sort of an, uh, a feel for them like an exponential or like uh, uh, maybe, as I mentioned a moment ago, the derived model for gas flow uh, in a system. Um, I, I'm not saying that semi-analytical models are not something we want to use because in a minute I'm going to tell you that we definitely need something to improve our, our DCA RTA interface and a semi-analytical model may be there. Analytical model as well, there are a few of those. Obviously the exponential decline is an analytical model, but there are a number as well. Uh, like I said, we've derived some that are, you can call them semi-analytic because of a founding assumption, but they're basically analytical. And then there's Ouija board models. These are where people just make something up and they fit it to data set. You know, I've warned people over and over again that to go back and look at the behavior of B of T and D of T uh, from these uh, models that are just contrived and make sure that they have some sort of physical uh, resemblance to an expected B of, D, B of T or D of T trend. PTA and unconventionals, I just put a question mark there. You can see I've made these interpretations. I've made other interpretations of PTA. I'm the guy who said we shouldn't be doing PTA and unconventionals. And yes, I put my foot in my mouth on that one because there is some use. I've seen PTA in uh, very tightly spaced um, well developments that's very useful. I'm not talking about frac hits, but I'm talking about uh, looking at how the, the fracture system yields an interconnectivity of the behavior. Uh, more proxy models, uh, this is along the lines of the power law family. Is it going to be anomalous diffusion? Is it going to be fractals? Is it going to be something else? Uh, really, we also need to focus on the well interference. And I have to admit that I did a lot of this kind of work several years ago, but you have to have very high resolution pressure data. It has to be measured in situ. It has to be bottom hole pressures as well. And, it, and bottom hole pressure and bottom hole temperature are really going to be critical for uh, well interference effects. RTA, uh, should we consider more effort on multi-phase models? Um, I want to be careful what I'm saying because I don't want anybody to think this is a priority because we, we have a lot of work in multi-phase models. We have a lot of simulation models out there. We have a lot of uh, workflows based on simulation models as well. Are there additional diagnostic concepts? And this is something we have to think about as well. Uh, did we miss something? You know, we talked about over here, this uh, group of diagnostics. You know, is there something we missed? Um, I know some people might be thinking, okay, Fourier transforms or other kinds of transforms are maybe trying to capture uh, an understanding of the curvature of the system or some other feature, some spectral analysis method. I don't know. I put in deconvolution because this is something we looked at 15 years ago, a graduate student and I did. He did a nice job with it. Um, I just don't know that the data is going to warrant, um, you know, resolution that will give us a deconvolution that's meaningful. Multi-well analysis, um, we're going to talk about that more in a second as well. This is something that's absolutely critical. So what does the industry want? They want a simple and direct RTA method. They want distinct diagnostics to estimate or to understand flow regimes. And they want multi-well diagnostics and interpretations. Um, and some additional slides that I provided in this presentation, I give some guidance on that. I'm not going to cover it today. But what we had a lot of pressure on us for uh, at this ATW was uh, for the development of an RTA proxy model that will fit essentially everything. And this is something that you kind of have to think about. What are, what are they saying? What they want is an RTA proxy model that doesn't require so much setup, that doesn't require having to have a, a real reservoir model, having to have an SRV definition, having to have a uh, definition of all the completion parameters and everything else, having to have a, an estimate of the, the fluid property behavior or other things. And I know there are people in this audience that are aware that there are some RTA proxies out there, but these are literally proxies. They're, they're not necessarily something that would represent the data uh, or the, the behavior in the truest sense. And I myself have proposed some of these things. But what I'm really concerned about, what I'm really asking is, can we create an RTA proxy like we did for DCA that will fit almost everything? And I will tell you an example of that is the power law exponential, which resulted from a conversation during question and answer where someone said, you know, if you're so smart, why don't you create a model that'll match anything? 
And that was more or less the genesis of uh, of that. Now, I wasn't trying to create a model. I was trying to create an understanding. So I went back and looked at the BFT behavior and the DFT behavior to understand that. Maybe the, the RTA proxy will be along those lines as well. So that is the end of my prepared presentation. I was asked to provide you some questions that if I were in the audience, what I might ask. Um, you know, these are just off the top of my head things that, that you may or may not want to ask. Um, and so now we'll start the question and answer period, and I'll hand it back to Juan Pablo, Francisco, and Danielle. Hi. Well, thanks, Tom, very much for your presentation. I guess those those five questions that, that you have posed in the in the screen. Uh, Maybe the first one is, is one question that, that appears in the in the questions in the chat. So you, you want to start with that one and I'll then continue with the with the asked questions in the in the chat if you if you don't mind. OK, so as I mentioned earlier, linear flow is a condition where and I did not include a diagram on this, but it's a condition where the fractures, uh, the pressure profiles from the fractures are non interfering, but that the fractures themselves dominate the performance. So this is where um, in a very low permeability environment, we're essentially seeing only production from the fracture system uh, or and the nearby well, uh, sorry, the nearby reservoir, um, the, the reservoir near to the fracture system. So there's a pressure propagation between the fractures. Now, um, linear flow can only exist when those conditions are met. If there is a short circuit, if there are multiple fractures um, from from different wells touching each other, you'll lose that, as I also showed with the simulation study. If there are complex fractures, you may lose this as well. Um, it, it may not be that, that you're going to see a linear flow sign uh, signature. And I want to warn people, you know, the eye likes to see what the eye likes to see. So thinking that you're seeing a straight line on a plot of the productivity index or the reciprocal productivity index versus uh, square root of time uh, could lead you to some serious misinterpretations. And I know there'll be people who disagree with me, but I just want to try to clarify that please be careful with this. I, if you're going to do this, if you're going to focus on linear flow, then also focus on a full RTA match. I guess that's my my suggestion. Okay. Thank you, Francisco. Okay, there, there are some others, some other questions that that repeat at least the, the late motif of the question, but first, Let's do one that's more general. Uh, what type of reservoir model is being used for interpretation with the RTA program? Is it mandatory that you use dual porosity? Is it mandatory that you use a geomechanical relationship? So this that's is a great question. You know, I did not use either one of those effects in these analyses. Um, okay. To my knowledge, uh, that wasn't warranted here, but to other people on the call, they're in the chat, I can see they're making comments about they know their well better than than we do, obviously, and and so they're making comments about things they're seeing. the The critical issue with geomechanical models is that you really have to see some sort of degradation in performance. What we saw here was that after the shut in, most of the performances improved substantially, and that's also a possible um, explanation of the geomechanical model because the fracture reinflates and the water equilibrates and maybe the water drops to the bottom of the fracture system. Everybody's had that thought as well. Um, but sufficient, you know, in my mind, going to the more complex models uh, just for the sake of a match may or may not be warranted. Now, I will tell you, there's a lot of people who are probably going to say, yeah, but, you know, so and so says that if you do this, then you'll get a much better match. And that's probably true because you're characterizing something, but I want to know that that something is real and it's not just an artifact of the uh, the operations. So thanks for that. Okay. Well, there's another one a little bit too general, but there, there's a couple of times that it repeats. So uh, any recommendations for operational challenges like liquid loading, choke management strategies, cycling production for optimization and liquid unloading? I guess I will focus also, there, there's a couple of questions that they all, all uh, mentioned choke managers strategies in Baca Muerta. Is there any recommendation for that? You know, this is um, one of the situations where those of us who've looked at a lot of choke management, um, I, I really tried hard to come up with a methodology to analyze choke management uh, affected data with 
uh, a reservoir model or with a proxy. And I'm not saying that I devoted my life to it, but you know, I, I thought, well, there's some reservoir information in here and we should be able to extract it. My concern right now is that it's so dominated by uh, the initial water unloading that I'm not sure what that looks like. And I do have a colleague, uh, I'm sure some people know this as well, that, that has created a model that interprets that heavily water loaded um, choke management or that, that uh, flow back type data. I'm not sure how I feel about that because I, I, you know, I felt after I stopped looking at that and went back and just tried to correlate um, sort of holistically the uh, the choke and the pressure and the rate that you could see certain patterns emerging and some uh, flowback systems or some flowback data, I should say, or some flowback cases correlate very well and then you have an outlier and probably you know, you want to look at those outliers as a mechanism to understand why uh, choke management had such a dramatic effect on a given case. I hope that helps. Uh, as for artificial lift, you know, I uh, I sat through a presentation for the students the other day, which was by a vendor of artificial lift methods. And, you know, because he was um, very much in love with what he was doing, he was very thorough. And, you know, I... Uh, I have a phrase that I say about artificial lift and is if you wait, you're too late. Um, you know, I think we need to think about artificial lift earlier. I think we need to think about artificial lift being aggressive. Uh, once you put that back pressure on this fracture system, I'm not sure you're going to be able to uh, unload it and and get that um, that recovered performance the way you think you will. And maybe there are people on here that say, OK, what about refracts? And refracts can help. I mean, we've all seen refracts that even uh, in a parent well that that cause the rate in a child well to quadruple. That's multiple of four. But artificial lift is still going to be there. You're still going to have a lack of energy support to move this fluid to the surface at some point. And, you know, I was surprised that you know there were some gadgets that came out in the early shale boom that that people would try to uh, perhaps uh, go all the way to the toe or halfway down the wellbore to unload uh, the wellbore continuously um, there may be some practices like that but i think in general people try to stay out of the the horizontal section with um, artificial lift but i'm wondering if you know something like that might help us better unload these wells and and see a larger eur a longer well life etc so i'll throw and, that out and, and they can contact me later if they okay, want to yell now at me. that you mentioned you mentioned that if it's a lift in, in, a, in an oil well for example how about cyclic injection and gas injection for that sure we did. we uh, the vast majority of um wells in the permian basin are gas injected or gas lifted uh there's in the Midland Basin, operators tend to prefer uh, ESPs, a um, little bit lower oh, pressure. I, I, I don't probe. mean in the in the in the well, I mean to the reservoir. I mean to inject. Oh, like, you mean EUR, EUR. Yeah. EUR. Um, you know, in the United States, uh, we have the Fifth Amendment to our Constitution, which uh, prohibits us from self-incrimination. I think <laughs> I'm going to say that um, the. Uh, we all know there are EOR projects going on, and we all know that people are using uh, rich gas injection. Some may even be using some sort of solvent. Um, I know that uh, a faculty colleague and I are, are, are working with a student on using uh, or simulating, not, not uh, actually working this, but uh, CO2, um, and I'm sure there's plenty of other people that are doing something similar to that. When you're leaving 93, 94% of the oil in place, you know, you're going to want to go back and get it with an EUR methodology. The question to me is economics and timing. Uh, if you're going to cyclic, um, you know, inject a huff and puff on these wells, um, what's the right duration for injection? What's the right duration for soaking and so on? I, I chaired a, an ATW back in 2015 and I said, just as a show of hands, for those of you who are operators, how many of you have either either have or plan an active uh, gas injection project? And the vast majority of people put their hands up. Last month, we had a similar uh, meeting in Midland, Texas on 
uh, the Permian Basin, which includes the Midland and the Delaware Basins. And the question was asked in a different way that how many of you believe uh, your company will deploy uh, cyclic gas or, or some sort of in, you know injection? And, and again, a lot of hands went up. I just don't have any um, experience with it. Um, there is some experience with some early uh, naturally fractured, not unconventional literally, but some some it is low permeability, but um, but I don't have any any direct interaction. I'd love to, but I don't have any direct interaction with cyclic gas injection for enhanced recovery, which is a really sad thing to waste all that time saying that, but I don't. So <laughs> OK, mm. there's, there's another question, which is more funny, if you want to call it. Someone asks that uh, you mentioned a lot of times the, the quality of the of the wellhead pressure and, and how to translate it to them. He asked, how would you sell downhole measurements to management? Um, so in when, with another hat on, I went to uh, management in a consulting sense, um, someone I was consulting for, and I said, you know, this is information that's relatively cheap to get that is um, going to be extremely valuable in the long term and can reasonably uh, influence our development decisions. And it was amazing how well that was received, but you know, and I don't know how things are structured in Bakamorta, but the cost was shared among the partners. And of course, the data had to be as well. Um, but then you run into something where people do not want uh, equipment in their well bore. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that you're facing the challenge of completing and maintaining the cheapest possible well bore, and people don't want. Uh, as as they call it, jewelry, joyeria in the well bore. I I found that a really difficult argument, you know. And after about a year and a half, we had uh, something like 130 gauges installed, maybe 140. And there was a case where out in the middle of nowhere, we had put a gauge that actually showed a background pressure drop, and it probably saved the organization. Uh, tens of millions of dollars not to drill wells there. Uh, so that kind of information was really useful. There was actually a some sort of a shale gouge or something that had, had caused, uh, you know, an immense leakage in the system. Um, you know, I'm on the other hand, having gauges, you know, can show you behavior that you never thought you'd see before. There was a, a situation where a well was being stimulated 10 patterns that's 10 same number of fingers that we have away and the pressure gauge in the well of interest picked it up and not only did it pick up the pressure but it picked up a temperature anomaly from that as well which was truly amazing that the uh, it was literally pushing fluid through the fracture system and we picked up a, a temperature anomaly as well Something like that tells me that you know the the value of that data is is almost indisputable, but uh, it's not uncommon to present to management, you know, a discussion of like to have a pressure gauge, and they say no, you know, we we've already been down this road. We don't think it adds anything. So you have to make the case: is life better with it or without it? And then you have to make a business case for how much money you can save or how much value you can create by having that knowledge. So that's not a very good answer because I tell you, I, I did get beat up a lot over this, but in the end, you know, it was uh, several million US dollars and I think it generated, you know, 10 times that in value and it, it, it still is. So I, I would just say that, that, you know, once you have, and I will say that you have to contract with a vendor. You have to agree to a certain number of cases. You have to, you know, go through uh, vendors for remote transmission of data, et cetera, et cetera, which is a lot easier now. I know a lot of people are using Starlink for uh, high frequency transmission, so that's a lot easier now as well. Um, so long-winded answer as well, Francisco, but I do have direct experience with that, and and I do understand there's pushback from management, but I also understand that that these data are they're probably the most critical reservoir information we'll get. So hopefully management will see that in, as a positive. There's a, do you think Obalo is still 
room for more questions. Tom, are you okay? Couple of I'm fine. Uh, we can keep going. Um, okay. I think there we're going to start. Question. Sure. An interesting question that it's uh, something a little bit out of the out of the box. Uh, someone asks if it's possible the utilization of RTA techniques for geological CO2 storage, say in aquifers, to estimate, for example, the available storage for volume. Yes. Do we have any um, um, and I can forward them to uh, work that we did, you know, almost 30 years ago. Oops, sorry about that. Um, I was going to make a note to myself. I'll just get that on the other screen. Pardon me. Um, yeah, the uh, the bottom line is that we did this for a uh, a large scale uh, field in West Texas, and we were using uh, injection uh, data, uh, which there were so I don't want to say several hundred, but there were well over 100 injection wells that were fully monitored, and we would use that uh, for um, in an RTA sense. And again, I can cite the uh, the references if the individual wants to contact me. So, you know, yeah. I've been kind of waiting for this, um, you know, sort of like uh, waiting for Christmas. I've been waiting for someone to come talk to me about uh, injection analysis using RTA. Um, but yeah, you can definitely monitor long term injection analysis. Uh, we have also monitored long term uh, large scale injection analysis of uh, shale plays where they're disposing of the water, but that's not really the question they're asking. They're asking about, uh, you know, sequestering or to storing CO2 in aquifers. Yeah, you can. I would, uh, again, by the nature of, of what you're doing, you're going to have to spend a lot of money on the well. You're going to have to, I would make sure that you have uh, bottom hole pressure measurements. In that case, it might be in easier because the, the CO2 is probably relatively um, homogeneous and you could calculate the flowing bottom hole pressure based on that, but I'd still get a uh, a bottom hole pressure gauge if you could. But yeah, there shouldn't be any any problem with uh, with using that for that purpose. I don't I don't see anything that's obvious to me at the moment. Now, you know, some there may be some differences in interpretation because of the nature of CO2, um, you know, diffusing into water. But I, I would I would think that the behavior would be very similar. Um, you know, to what we've done in the past with injection uh, test analysis using RTA. Sorry for that long-winded answer, but just wanted it's to make okay. sure everybody understood. We have one, one, one comment. It's not a question specifically, but it's a good, it's a good uh, adding to what you have done because it's someone that, of course, he has best information because he says to clarify examples four and five, he he adds some data. So maybe you want to go to those examples. He says the two wells are from the same pad, so the well spacing is 250 meters, 820 feet, and they are heavily infer interfered with each other. So the the bottom hole pressure of the well five of the first build up is not erroneous due to the interference with well four, which is in production. So instead of okay. a normal build up, you get that you get that uh, fall of behavior. Yeah, Remember I that? saw that, and and I was trying to think. Okay, I I understand what you're saying. But erroneous, the, the erroneous may not be the right word, but what am I supposed to do with what? What can I do with this? You know, that that's more my question. So I apologize if I offended even that's Juan Jose Fernandez. I mean, even if you have the information that is being interfered, it's not something that you can add in the analysis. No, but if we if we were to use both wells um, and we were to look back at where this occurred, I don't have dates. I only have times. Um, so it might be a little hard to coordinate that, although I could shift it. So both wells, I guess, were shut in at the same time uh, for the long buildup. Sorry, uh, wells. Damn it, wells four and five. So there, there's the main shut in. Well, I wonder if this feature represents something that's happening in well five. Then, and I guess I'll just have to ask Mr. Fernandez to contact me and give me more background. Um, Okay. But that that all makes a lot more sense now. I I was not informed of that, nor did I know it. But so yeah, that that both these wells were shut in at the same time for that 200 day buildup. Yeah. So that that's they, yeah, they, I they see were that. testing you. <laughs> right. But this is um so this is what was happening in well four. Well four is still uh, on production, I guess, and that's where it communicates. That's why the pressure built up and then drops. So. 
yeah, I could see that. So sorry, I didn't mean any insult. Um, no, I guess it's, it just no, no, just didn't offended. didn't know what was going on there. So I thought it was. I went back and looked at tubing head pressure, and and it was doing the same thing. So yeah, that makes sense now. That's well for producing. Okay, no problem. Do, do, do you do you do you are you aware that there are some uh, there's some for example the 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 harmony suite of of IHS. They they have the RTA, the analytical RTA or monophasic, and then they have something like a like a numerical model very similar to the to the RTA way of managing it, and supposedly it's multi-phase. Do, do you have any like experience in comparing RTA analysis monophase with with multi-phase uh, analysis, and what is the typical outcome? I mean, it's optimistic, pessimistic compared to the when, when you include the three phases: uh, gas, water, and, and oil. I think I'm better defer that question since it's more of a, a vendor question. I will tell you that um, I have worked as a as a member of a team, let's say, on comparing uh, monophase and multiphase analyses. And my job is really to be the the discipline person because you know when you start matching a multiphase case, you'll make different um, conditions and so on um, to match something. And so that was more or less been my role. And I know that all of the vendors uh, that we could mention have uh, a multi-phase simulation module tied to their um, their analyses, if you would want to go that way. Um, you know, this is a really awkward moment because it, it it's going to suggest to people that I'm I'm stuck on analytics or I'm stuck on um, kind of characteristic behavior. But one of the reasons I keep talking about total rate is that I typically do an analysis with a total mass rate as a substitute for trying to do multi-phase analyses. Um, okay. I did do some work a while back with uh, a proxy model for uh, RTA where we uh, simply track the GOR and water ratio. Uh, the goal there was not to model it as much as to uh, create a a monophasic or a, a, I say a quasi monophasic behavior and then to convert it back to a multiphasic behavior by uh, using those. Uh, so there's also been some work recently which wasn't mentioned by anybody which I probably should have expected where people have gone to using uh, a slightly different formulation for RTA based more on uh, a mass flow rate and I did do that quite a bit of that and I guess technically you do that whenever you convert the rates to a okay, massive. Do you see? Rate. Do you see a? Do you see a trend? Yes, there there is a difference. There's there's certainly things. And, um, and difference is always in one to one side. Um, I mean, you know, I think most people would want you to say that the analytic model is always more pessimistic because it's not capturing you know all the energy yeah, from yeah. other uh, phases, but it really depends. There's there's. Um, there's a lot of different interpretations. Most of the things that I think we probably wanted to see when we were looking at those multi-phase models was the uh, prediction of gas oil ratio and on some other cases, water oil ratio. So, you know, if you were asking me in the last year, what have I looked at in multi-phase, it would be to uh, to work with people who are trying to understand uh, gas oil ratio performance. Um, and in that sense, yeah, you'd have to go to a multi-phase model. I mean, I've done a lot of work correlating the GOR behavior, uh, but as far as modeling it, you'd have to go to another model to do that. Okay. I hope that I hope that helps. I know I know I'm kind of dancing around some of the answers, but it's because I don't want to give the impression that you know this is something that I feel I'd, like a legal sense. I don't want to feel like I'm I'm being asked for an expertise question on something that I wouldn't be comfortable doing. So. Okay. But all the so vendors do offer a multi-phase uh, option on their simulations now. I I wouldn't speculate which one's better or worse, but um, you know, just tell people to to give them a try. Okay, so this is a, a short question of, uh, that says, "What is your opinion on using fractional RTA? Does does that ring you a bell? Fractional RTA to better understand the efficiency and number of fractures in a horizontal one." I'm not sure what, um, what, what they mean is analyzing each uh, zone separately, I think, uh -huh. and that has been proposed and in some limited cases it has been attempted and performed. Um, nothing would make me happier than to do an analysis, if, if we're talking about this, would, would be to perform an analysis on a fracture by fracture basis 
but it would drive the cost of operations to infinity. There's, you know, I, I can't imagine they'd let you do much more than a few of those. Uh, I, if that's what they're talking about, you know, that that has been discussed and it has been performed on a limited limited basis. Obviously, not every zone was tested. It'd be the analogous uh, thing of testing multi zones in a vertical well, uh, if that's what they're asking. I guess, but it's not very clear. Yeah. So then there are a couple of clarifications on some on some of the slides, but I think that can be uh, asked to you directly. Yeah, they can they can take it up with me and not make me look it's foolish. It's not a common, <laughs> a common place. Yeah. yeah. Oh, now that some some new questions appear right now. Um, how how about the uh, the usage of initial reservoir pressure coming from defeat or overcharge pressure generated by hydraulic stimulation. I mean, when you plug, I'm going to I'm going to defer that to other people who are defit, uh, you know, experts. I, I I could talk about it, but I wouldn't be comfortable with the outcome. I'm I'm not, you know I shouldn't keep saying this, but I'm just not a defit person. Um, there there are a number of people who are, and I'll I'll just defer to them if that's okay. If we use an ESP, how accurate will be to change pump intake pressure to represent the uh, bottom hole pressure? And does that you know I, I do that I do that all the time. You know, people give me pump intake pressures, and I use that for RTA. Um, unless there's some bias, you know, I I feel like that's almost like a gauge. You know, that that should be highly representative of uh, you know the conditions. So. I mean, someone may argue you want to change the datum or that sort of thing, which is fine, but I've used DSP pressures for 30 years, you know, I'm, they're sometimes they're the best data you'll ever get. Yeah, right. Well, then that's it for now. Uh, thanks, Tom, very much. I will I will handle now the meeting back to Juan Pablo. Okay. To, to me, it has been a great pleasure to moderate this talk and hear you out. So I'll just say goodbye. OK, my pleasure as well. Thank you, everyone. And I'm going to uh, stop my video and I'm going to uh, also stop sharing. OK, thank you very much, Tom and and to the audience. And we are deeply honored to have to have you here. And I leave the word a little word from Daniel Rosato, that is our section chairman. Uh, Daniel, you have to open the mic. Sorry, yeah, you're muted. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for this uh, lecture. It has been excellent, and uh, we look forward to see you here for our uh, symposium on March. So, uh, an honor to have another opportunity to get uh, an input to your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. I look forward to seeing everyone again as well. Hey. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Tom. Okay, we'll, we'll close great out. Great Thank you, everyone. You and okay, I'll, I will send you um, the final version of everything, one Pablo. Okay, that's perfect. Okay. Deep, Take care, everyone. Okay, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. Uh,